Well, hello everyone. This video is going to go over the snakes of North Dakota and try to help you learn how to identify those species and learn a little bit about each one. So while North Dakota isn't the most diverse state as far as reptiles and amphibians go, we do have some really great species here. And so today we want to talk about them uh, and how to identify them or differentiate them from each other. Again, as always, all animals were handled with proper permits, using proper safety and um, protocols, and they were released back into the wild. We ask that everyone respects the wildlife of North Dakota, so please respect all flora and fauna. Um, be aware of your local and state regulations. Um, if you have questions, if you need help identifying a species, or if you're an, a teacher and you want to incorporate North Dakota reptiles and amphibians, the herps, into your curriculum, please reach out. You can reach out to North Dakota Game and Fish, or you can reach out to myself at one of the two email addresses here, or find me on Twitter at Herp Ecomorph. And as always, we really encourage you to um, submit your observations of reptiles and amphibians while you're outside enjoying all the great things that North Dakota has to offer. So sign up for the Herp Mapper app at herpmapper.org, or you can register observations at ndherpatlas.org. Um, this information is private uh, and goes just to the organizers, and then North Dakota Game and Fish and myself can get access to these data, and we can better understand where our reptiles and amphibians are and how the populations are doing. Okay, with that, let's get into the first species. We'll start with the common or eastern garter snake. So first thing I want to point out is it's garter, G-A-R-T-E-R. -E um, people often say garden snake or gardener snake or gardener snake, um, which is fine. But uh, these are our garter snake species in the genus Thamnophis. So this is Thamnophis sertalis. Um, Thamnophis sertalis is known by the common garter, the eastern garter, the red-sided garter snake. Um, so it has a lot of uh, common names, uh, but they all refer to the same species. Uh, garter snakes typically have this uh, black background color with yellow stripes. Uh, where the stripe is, is is important in differentiating species. Um, this common or eastern garter snake also tends to incorporate some color, and so we start to see this red or orange in some species, or some pop, or I shouldn't say in this species, in some areas. Um, this is why, in, uh, like in places in Iowa where they tend to have a lot more red, they tend to be called the red sided garter snake, even though it's the same species. In North Dakota, where this one is captured, you will see red on, on lots of individuals, but this individual is also from North Dakota, and we see no red on this individual. So it's not a, um, a definitive characteristic. Um, there are a couple definitive characteristics that can help us differentiate the two garter snake species that we have. Um, if it's basically if it's black with yellow stripes, we know that it's a garter snake. We just have to figure out which of the two species it is. So the first thing we do is we look at the position of the stripe. And so these long scales here, these long flat or rectangular scales, those are the ventral scales. And then we see as this, we get to the side and back of the snake, these scales change, these dorsal scales. So they're more circular. So on the Thamnophis, the first yellow stripe is on the second and third scale row. So if we go from the ventral side, there's one row of dark scales or black scales, and then two rows where the yellow stripe is. That tells us that it's um, a common or eastern garter snake, not the plains garter snake, which we'll talk about next. That, that The stripe is up one scale row there. The other thing we can look at is the lips. So um, the eastern garter snake has no markings on its upper or lower lip or labial scales, um, whereas often the plains garter snake has black bars on its upper lip. And then again, in some populations or some locations, we see this reddish marking on the back. Okay. But again, if it's black and bl a black snake with yellow stripes, we know that it's a garter snake. We look at the placement of the stripe, the lip, and if it has red coloration or not to help us differentiate between the two garter snakes. 
Uh, the Eastern Garter Snake is found throughout the state, so we see them often in the Red River Valley. This individual was actually caught out uh, in southwest North Dakota. I shouldn't say caught, we, uh, he was released. But again, lots of yellow or orange on this individual. You can see the, the bright coloration, no bars on the lips. And if we look, there's one scale row here before the yellow stripe starts. Those three things tell us that it's an eastern or common garter snake. Um, eastern or common garter snakes tend to be a little more closely associated with water um, than the plains garter snake. They tend to meet, feed more on um, you know, earthworms, fish, toads, and frogs, whereas um, the plains garter snakes tend to be a little farther away from water and tend to feed on you know, baby birds, mammals, but they'll also eat um, the, sort of the same variety of things. So let's move to that next uh, garter snake, the plains garter snake, Thamnopus radix. Um, in general, these tend to be larger than the eastern, but I'm, I'm just going to say that in general because they, they're, the, the size range overlaps quite a bit, and we can find big easterns and we can find big uh, plains garter snakes. Um, I just noticed in general we tend to see the plains tend to be a little larger. Uh, again, these are found statewide, uh, but they tend to be in drier habitats than the eastern. So they can both be found around wetlands. It's not that you'll never find plains garter snakes around aquatic bodies of water, um, but they're not as closely associated with them. So you find them in upland prairies and sort of woodlands more than we would easterns. Again, their diet is quite diverse too. They'll eat earthworms and insects, fish, uh, frogs and toads. Uh, they tend to eat ver uh, birds and mammals more than the Easterns do. Okay. Let's look at the, the same three characteristics we looked at in the Eastern to see how they vary in um, the plains. So, the, so here we have a black snake with three yellow stripes, the same as in the Eastern garter snake, right? So again, we've got the black background coloration, a stripe on each side, and then one down the middle. It's the exact same thing we would expect to see in the eastern or common garter snake. First thing we notice is there's no red, so that would tell us that maybe it's um, not an eastern. If we look at where that stripe occurs, so here's the ventral scales here, one scale row, two scale rows, three and four, so scale rows three and four is where the stripe is located, the lateral stripe is located on either side of the plains garter snake. Again, on an eastern or common, it would be on scale rows two and three. So in the plains garter snake, it shifts up just a row. Um, you're probably asking yourself how I expect you to do this, like you're not gonna grab the snake and be able to count. But um, after you look at enough of them, it, it actually is pretty distinctive because we can see a little bit of black here before the stripe, and on the eastern, we, we don't really get that. The other thing is to look at the lips here. The plains garter snake often has black bars on its supralabial scales or its upper lip. Okay? Again, not always, but often. So we can look at where the stripe is placed. Is it on scale rows two and three or three and four? And does it have black bars on its lip? Again, found throughout most of the state. Um, Probably not as, so there are areas where we find both species, uh, but there are often habitats that distinguish between the two of them. Again, eastern or common garter snakes tend to f be more closely associated with aquatic or moist habitats. Plains garter snakes tend to be more associated with sort of drier prairies. And again, um, very similar species. So here we see the radix or plains garter snakes on the left and the common garter snake on the right. Again, sort of black to dark green in, in coloration and three yellowish stripes. The common garter snakes often have red and no uh, black bars on the lips. And the scale row or the first lateral line is very close to the belly. Um, the radix has black bars on its lips, never has red or orange coloration aside from the stripes, and the stripe is one scale row higher on the side, right? So again, if we just look here, we can really don't see any black on the belly. Here we can see that nice black and green before the first stripe. And I know that it's, you know, the difference between scale rows two and three and three and four. 
but I can I can tell you after spending enough time out in the field looking at the snakes, I can watch one flash by me, and if I can see black here, I'm 99% confident it's a radix. If I don't see any of it, um, I know it's a, a common. So the radix tend to appear more striped than the common because the, we don't get that hint of background coloration between the belly and the first stripe. So there, there really is a sort of an, a, a difference even at a sort of a, a quick glance. You just have to get accustomed to, to seeing that difference. Again, if at any point you have trouble differentiating the two, contact myself or North Dakota Game and Fish and we'll help you out. Uh, the next snake is, is one of my favorite, the Plains Hognose Snake or Plains uh, hognose or western hognose, um, so it goes by several common names, um, but Heterodon nasiscus. This is sort of a medium-sized snake. It tends to be heavy-bodied, so it tends to be sort of short and thick, uh, not really long and skinny. Um, we don't see a ton of variation in their color, so they're sort of um, sort of all similar looking, but they have this this brown sort of light to dark brown background color, and then darker brown blotches on them. So they're sort of a light brown with dark brown spots. Their belly is sort of black with white speckling. Um, and this is pretty consistent. These are common in the pet trade now, so you'll see lots of designer things in the pet trade. Um, but real native hognose snakes are light brown with dark brown splotches and sort of black bellies with white sort of um, patches within them. The way they get their name is their rostral scale or their nose scale. So the nose is keeled, sort of pointed up. Uh, so it looks like the, a hog's snout. Uh, they use this to dig. They, um, they dig up toads. They're, they're toad specialists. They dig up turtle eggs. They like to eat turtle eggs. Um, they burrow over winter, right? So they spend a lot of time underground or sort of at the base of veg thick vegetation, so they're they're really quite hard to find. Um, they're elusive, but again, they really are um, magnificent snakes. We'll talk about a few things that really make them kind of interesting. They are found throughout North Dakota, but again, they're one of the more difficult snakes to find. They're camouflaged. They spend lots of time underground. If they're not underground, they're tucked into tight, veg dense vegetation, um, and they tend not to to move until you almost step on them. So. So again, here's a couple of uh, more photos. Here's an adult female. You can see actually she's got a big scar right here where it's something had got her. Um, but again, this darker or this brown sort of background with darker brown spots and then a black belly with white um, patches put into it. Here you can see the same individual when we first spotted her. Um, so they tend to put on this really big show. Uh, when you capture them, they will cover their heads, they'll hiss, they'll flatten their neck. So often in Western North Dakota, these are called sand vipers, even though um, they're not a viper, but they can flatten their neck like a cobra does. And they'll bluff strike at you quite a bit, which means they'll strike at you, but their mouth will be closed. So they don't actually bite. Well, they can bite, but they don't intend to bite when they do a bluff strike. And so they'll puff up, they'll hiss, they'll make themselves seem really angry. If you're still not deterred, they actually roll over on their backs and stick out their tongue and play dead. So they have this really dramatic anti-predator behavior where they'll act all tough. If that doesn't work, they'll play dead. So they'll musk on themselves, they'll defecate, they'll put their tongue out. They're like, you know, this, this predator is not going to eat a rotten snake, right? You can turn them over and then they'll flip back over on their belly like... They really are quite a, a interesting snake in to interact with. Again, I encourage that you leave wildlife alone, but um, these snakes really do put on quite a show when they're disturbed. Um, again, found throughout the state, we, we really probably need to do a better job of understanding where they are, and so hopefully this is where you come in and help upload your observations. You can see this great nose here that they use as a shovel. Hognose are a, what we call a rear fang snake, so they do produce a venom. Uh, that venom is injected via fangs at the back of their mouth, so they have to chew on the prey item in order to inject the venom. It's really designed for toads, so it's an anticoagulant in toads, so they, so they bleed out as the, 
the hognose is trying to subdue them. Uh, it shouldn't pose much of a threat to humans, um, namely because you shouldn't be letting a hognose snake chew on you. So it has to chew on you to get to the venom injected. It has to really work. It basically has to get your, you know, your finger or your part of your hand to the back of its mouth and then sort of chew on you a bit to introduce the venom. So I'm hoping you're not letting a hognose snake chew on you. Most people have only a minor reaction to the venom. It's sort of like a bee sting. But again, like any venom, some people have a larger reaction than others. So again, please don't disturb our wildlife. Just appreciate it in situ or in the wild. Take some photos, upload it to Hurt Mapper, and let it go on its way. Um, but again, they are technically a venomous species, um, although they pose real no, no real threat to humans. The next species is a smooth green snake, Ophidri Ophidris vernalis. So this is a, a very small, sort of thin snake. So they're long and skinny. They get about 11 to 20 inches long. Um, very little variation. This is a brilliant bright green snake uh, with a white to yellowish belly. Um, it looks like a blade of grass. In fact, when it's sort of out hunting, it will sort of move like a blade of grass where it'll sort of shake its head and make it look like it's just grass blowing in the wind as it moves on. Um, these are very difficult to spot. They're small. They're fast and they're perfectly camouflaged, but they are found throughout a majority of the state. These are just fascinating little snakes. Uh, they lay eggs, they eat uh, invertebrates. Um, they're just a great, great snake. Um, again, probably more common than we think. They're just very hard to find. Um, in some of the surrounding states, so the, this species is uh, threatened. And so um, there is a chance that populations are declining. We tend not to see a lot of smooth green snakes where we see other snakes, so garter snakes, um, likely because garter snakes will feed on these. And so uh, they do sort of require a, a better or more pristine prairie habitat without a lot of other snakes. Uh, and so that might be one reason where we're starting to see the, the, the population decline. Um, again, you can see this white to yellowish belly. Um, so there's there's actually two species in this photo. We'll talk about the yellow belly or the red belly snake next. But you can see um, these were uh, several individuals of two species captured at one sort of small area, and they were all pregnant females that were under these moist logs, getting ready to lay their eggs. Um, again, just a, a really hard snake to see because they're so perfectly camouflaged and they're so quick. But they're a gorgeous little snake, really fun to watch in the wild. Okay? Uh, again, found throughout the state, I would um, I would say we'd probably really need to go back and really intensively search for this snake, especially since it isn't uh, threatened in some of the surrounding areas, but just a really fascinating snake. Next is the red, red belly snake or northern red belly um, snake, Storia occipitum maculata. Um, this is North Dakota's smallest snake, so it's only about eight to inch, eight to ten inches long. Uh, a relatively skinny snake as well. There's really two color variants here. We can see the gray and then the brown. So there's a dark brown or copper variant and then a gray variant. Um, same species, they just tend to either be this copper color or this gray color. In both cases, the belly is this gorgeous red or orangish red. Um, and they have very little markings. You can see some striping on them, but not a whole lot of pattern. Um, we really don't know a lot about their state distribution because they tend to spend so much time undercover and they are so small. Um, most of our observations have been from the eastern portion of the state, a few in the central portion of the state. Um, again, this species eats invertebrates. It tends to be more closely associated with aquatic habitats like wetlands. Um, they eat a lot of soft-bodied insects, so worms, slugs. Um, but again, just a, a really small snake but really gorgeous animal you can you, know, you can see this great striping here the little bit of gray on the head and again very small this is on a gravel road right so this isn't a large rock this and these are just blades of grass really small we get a little bit of closer image on the head um, they will curl their lips when they're threatened but again it's such a small snake it really poses no threat to us Okay. And again, this great red belly. Look at that magnificent color on the belly. And this is a male. You can see the long tail, 
But again, we've got the brown or copper morph, which this one is, and then the gray morph. But they both have this magnificent red belly. Just take a look at that guy. Again, just gorgeous coloration. Hard to find. They do cross tend to cross roads uh, early evening looking out looking for invertebrates and unfortunately that causes a lot of road mortality uh, but finding them in the grass is pretty difficult you um, you can find them sort of under logs or boards around wetlands but again we, we don't know a lot about where this snake is or how the populations are doing but it is just a, the smallest snake in North Dakota really great really interesting helps keep invertebrate populations in check we're going to go from the smallest snake in North Dakota to the longest snake in North Dakota. And I'm going to stress longest because, uh, in my opinion, it's not the largest as there's another species that is heavier than this one. Um, but this is the longest snake in North Dakota. It can get up to 72 inches long. This is the, the bull snake. Uh, quite commonly referred to as just the gopher snake now. So it's uh, Pituophis catinifer, catinifer. It used to be Pituophis catinifer sei, so it was a subspecies of the gopher snake. Um, now they're generally just called gopher snakes, um, and they're all using the same common and scientific name, but there's um, gopher snakes, there's Sonoran gopher snakes. Um, I'm going to use bull snakes because that's what I grew up calling it, um, and I really love bull snakes. Well, I love all snakes, really, right? But, but these guys have a great personality as well. So their background color is sort of this yellow tan color so it's sort of a yellowish cream to a, a tan color and then they have dark blotches the blotches typically go from black at the head and then work to more of a, a, a chocolate brown as you go down the body uh, but again there can be some variation there um, they're found in western and central north dakota we don't have these on the eastern side of the state okay. um, pituophis tend to have a a bit of an attitude so again when disturbed they put up this big show that they're really tough uh, but honestly they they don't bite that often and they uh, tend to calm down relatively quickly they do possess so here's a here's a really dark one we found near central north dakota so you can see how dark it is here but again towards the tail the blotches lighten up towards a brown right here's one that we found on a road um, so again, they make themselves look really tough. They'll hiss. They have a special flap of skin over their trachea. So a snake's trachea is actually at the bottom of, of the floor of its mouth. Um, and snakes in the genus Pituophis have a special flap that lets them really create this loud hiss. Uh, they will strike. They will bite. Um, but mostly it's for show. Um, and so here again, here's another individual we found near Linton, North Dakota. Again, dark as it towards the head and it goes towards brown at the body. Um, but this one, you know, put on a big show and then two seconds later it was curled around, um, my lab mates cowboy hat and stayed there for a couple hours as we were doing some other work in the field. He was released and sent on his way again, just really great snakes, active foragers. So we tend to see them quite a bit there. Um, they go out and about looking for food. They eat mammals and birds, um, especially grassland birds, especially during breeding season as the eggs, uh, they'll eat the eggs, but they'll also eat the, the fledgling babies. Um, and so, you know, especially spring, early summer in the grasslands, we see these um, male and female bull snakes cruising around looking for their next meal. They go into to mammal burrows, right? Again, the longest snake, not the thickest, but they, they do a good job of controlling small mammal populations. Uh, but they also... Uh, prey on birds quite a bit and again we only see them in really the central south central and western portions of the state the next species is the yellow-bellied racer or just um just the racer colubra constrictor flabby ventris so this is sort of a long thin species this one is this one makes the bull snakes look inactive this is a, a very active forager very fast so it's active during the day. Um, they get about 23 to 50 inches in length. You're going to be more commonly around 24 to 36 inches. It's very rare to find one that's on the 50 inch range, but they, they're out there. The adults are typically sort of this silver gray um, with a yellow belly, 
a bright yellow belly, hence the name yellow belly racer. Um, but in portions of North Dakota, they're more of the background coloration on the back is so more of this green. We'll see a, an example that we found near Linton here in a little bit. But again, still the, the yellow belly. Um, again, found in central and western North Dakota. Um, the cool thing here is, well, one of many cool things about snakes, but in the racer, the juveniles look much different than the adults. So the juveniles are actually patterned, and then as they grow, the pattern sort of fades, and they get more of this solid, solid coloration. So these are two juvenile racers. Again, you might think that this looks like a bull snake. They're often confused for baby rattlesnakes, but they got these these really big eyes because they spend so much time actively foraging during the day. They've got really big eyes, um, and there's quite a bit difference in the head. But you can see the juveniles are just this pattern, this speckling. Still got the great yellow belly, but look a lot different than the adults. And as they get bigger, the pattern slowly goes away and fades into sort of this solid coloration that we see here. Okay. Again, we see them in central and, and western North Dakota. And this would be that individual we found near Linton. So it's more of a green than it is a silver or a gray. But again, great yellow belly, big eyes. Um, this is a, sort of an immature, well, this one's probably ready to breed, but you can see you, you can see there's still some speckling. So as this one's gotten bigger, it's losing its speckling and becoming more of a solid coloration. Um, very fast snakes, very active, very difficult to, to sort of, um, capture these guys and, and I've been working with reptiles my whole life um, these are very fast and, and if you don't spot them before they spot you they're they're gone again I I recommend that you leave wildlife alone but they're really a great snake uh, they will bite they do have sort of, they're not venomous but they have sort of fang teeth so they can um, they can make you bleed uh, but truly a great snake again feeding on a variety of things very active um, you know, just great little snakes. Uh, I'm going to save my, my favorite for last. This is the snake I've done most of the work on. This is the prairie rattlesnake, Crotalus viridus viridus. Uh, this is North Dakota's only truly venomous snake. Um, and that's going to be contentious. Some people are going to comment that when I use the word truly venomous here, I'm misusing it. So how we define venom really uh, is important. Um, when I'm using the truly venomous here is that rattlesnake venom is harmful to all humans. Whereas let's say hognose venom, um, most people have a minor, only a minor reaction to that. So um, here, when I say only truly venomous snake is that this is really the only snake in North Dakota. You really truly uh, will have a strong reaction to the venom. Again, I hope that you're not messing with any of these species, but definitely not rattlesnakes. Um, just because it's truly venomous doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place here, right? Um, and if we leave it alone, it'll leave us alone, right? This is North Dakota's largest snake. So again, it's not the longest, but it is truly the heaviest snake. So it gets to, this is 35 to 50 inches. I've, I've pulled large females that are closer to 55, 60 inches. Very heavy, so they have got this thick body. And so this would be what I would consider North Dakota's largest snake. If we think about snakes eating mammals, the prey rattlesnake will eat the largest mammals of any of the snake species that we have. So they'll feed on ground squirrels and prairie dogs and rats and mice, um, and they can take a much larger meal than um, than the, the bull snakes. Again, still feeding on similar things. They'll also eat birds. Um, they tend to only eat warm-blooded prey because they have heat sensing pits right here. So there's a pit viper. So right by their, um, between their nostril here and their eye, they have a thermal sensitive pit. So they actually have binocular thermal vision. That's pretty fascinating. They've got this rattle here that they use for um, sort of defense or anti-predator, right? So to warn you that they're there. Um, I will tell you prey rattlesnakes, um, unlike some rattlesnake species, which are very calm. Prairie rattlesnakes uh, will alert to threats quite quickly, and so you'll often hear them way before you see them. Okay? Again, found in central and western North Dakota. Um, they can be a range of colors. They can be sort of dark browns, this sort of light brown. I've seen some that sort of have a salmon or a pinkish hue to them. 
Um, but again, the blo- door, the brownish blotches down with a sort of a, a light brown to a salmon background coloration, the rattle, the big triangular shaped head, they're shorter, fat bodied, um, sort of tells us that they're a pit viper. Again, rattlesnakes do not chase people. If you get in between a rattlesnake and where it wants to hide, it's going to run towards its hiding spot or slither towards its hiding spot. Um, That doesn't mean it's chasing you. That means that you happen to be standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, They will get defensive quite quickly. That doesn't mean they're aggressive, right? So if you leave these snakes alone, they'll leave you alone, right? So here's a, a nice, healthy male we found near Linton. This snake was actually shot. So right here we can see a large scar. And so um, we actually found this snake the year before with the bullet hole in it. The bullet went straight through. The snake was able able to survive. Again, these snakes are often persecuted or killed because they are venomous or because people want the rattles. Um, Just leave wildlife alone. These snakes are very important parts of their ecosystem. Again, preying on mammal populations that no other snake can do or prey on. They're more efficient than a lot of the mammalian predators. They're, they provide food to other mammals and raptors, right? So they play critical roles in their environment. And if we just leave them be, the ecosystems will be healthier, function more normally, uh, and will keep pest populations in balance. Okay? So here's a juvenile. You can see juveniles tend to have a lot more sort of vivid coloration that tends to fade over time. But just got one little button here. Again, they overwinter in mammal burrows or rocky crevices that go below the frost line. Um, females give birth to live young. They don't lay eggs. Um, again, rattlesnakes are often perceived poorly, but they are a very critical part of our ecosystems here in central and western North Dakota. Okay, with that, that should help you identify the species of snakes in North Dakota. As always, we encourage you to respect wildlife and do not interfere with it if you don't have to. Uh, And also to help North Dakota Game and Fish and myself out, please uh, upload any observations to hurtmapper or ndherpatlas.org. Thank you.